Alright, so today we're going to continue to talk about uh, uh, egodicity and uh, Lyapunov exponents. So before I start, I want to uh, see if there are any questions or uh, clarifications I can make to uh, what we just uh, learned previously. Yeah. Like, regardless of what we pick as a initial condition, we explore all the uh, solutions space. Right? right. Okay. Yeah. So today, let's uh, uh, first uh, link the two previous definitions of egodicity. Okay. So through the uh, Birkhoff's egotic theorem. So, so this is a, a critical theorem, and basically, uh, really, the theorem that started the whole field of uh, egotic theory. Okay, so it basically says that if you have a, so if you have any, uh, let's say, let uh, rho be a probability measure over the phase space. Let's just uh, call it uh, omega. All right. So, for a function, for a function like observable, usually we call it right. Uh, let's say j that maps from the phase space to any real numbers. Okay, so that's basically something that uh, uh, operates on the phase space. If you give me a solution, I give you a value. Usually we call that uh, observable. So j bar, which is a function of u, the initial condition, defined as the limit of t goes to infinity, 1 over t. Uh, it's either an integral or a summation, depending on if you are a discrete or continuous dynamical system from 0 or t to t. Uh, phi, which is the operator that takes your initial condition and map it to the solution at time t, right? So j, the observable, operated, basically observed the solution at time t. So this whole thing we analyzed the last lecture is the time average of the observable, right? For a trajectory starting at u. It depends on the notation, right? So this u is our initial condition. You can denote it as u0, then both sides would have a u0. All right, you can call it the u uh, as an initial condition. All right, so this thing, first of all, exists. So uh, for for almost, well, for almost, or u. So what does it mean for most almost or u? Right. The the word almost means that uh, except for a measure zero set, except for a basically uh, a set whose probability measure on the row is equal to zero. Okay. So it basically just uh, uh, proves the existence of such limit. So how does the existence of this limit lead to the uh, coincidence of the two definitions. Okay, so remember the first definition, uh, the definition one is that uh, J U is independent of U, right? Or J U is a constant, almost uh, everywhere. And the definition two is the uniqueness. of the kind of a measure role, right? The kind of a probability that actually, uh, uh, that, that preserves, that uh, the transformation phi preserves. Okay, so how, how does that, uh, how does the, uh, just the, the mere existence lead uh, to the, the two definitions being the same? So let's, look at uh, uh, what we can do with uh, that moves from one to the other. Okay. So let's first uh, uh, use a very 
simple example. So what if j of u is not a constant? If j of u is not a constant, that actually helps us define a different measure, a different probability metric. Let's call it rho prime. Then let's define a rho prime. Okay, that again is a probability measure. That you give me a set, I give you a number, right? But this number is different. If you give me a set A, right, where A is a subset of the whole phase space, what I'm going to give you is is the um, is the expectation or the average of this j bar, okay, of this j bar over the set A. So uh, what does that mean? So that means, I me actually write it a little bit uh, more carefully. So it is the expectation of the function j bar times the indicator function of the set A. So basically, the indicator function is e e either equal to 1 or 0, depending on if u is within the set A or not in the set A. Right? So it's basically, it's almost like I mask the function j bar with the, uh, with the set A. Right? Basically, clear the value of j bar when uh, the, the u is not within the set divided over the expectation of j bar of u over the entire uh, phase space. Okay, so you can show that uh, this is also a proper probability measure. So why? Because if a is an empty set, right, this indicator function is zero everywhere and you would uh, get zero, right? If A is the entire set, entire phase space, a, I A would be equal to 1 everywhere, and you would get 1, uh, the, the denominator and numerator would be the same. You would get 1, right? Also, if you have a series of uh, uh, non-overlapping sets, you can show that uh, basically the the Numer the denominator is the same, right? But the numerator basically adds up, right? So the indicator function would uh, uh, take the values of one over non-overlapping areas, right? So so basically the uh, numerator would just uh, simply add up while the denominator is the same. So that also satisfies the uh, countable additive property. So rho prime is also a probability measure. Yes. So indicator function, yeah, thank you. So IA of U is equal to either 0 or 1 if U is not in A or U is in A. So that's the indicator function. Okay. So then what you can show is that uh, uh, right. And also Rho prime is also uh, preserved on the this map. So why is that the case? Because you see, if um, so, so, let's just uh, call it like this. So rho of a um, do. Okay. So now we have two different uh, probability measures. One is rho, one is rho prime, right? Rho preserves rho is preserved under the map of phi, and we want to show that rho prime is also preserved under the same map. So that basically needs us to show that the rho prime of A is equal to rho prime of phi of A under any uh, time transformation T. 
right? So let's see how that works. Okay, so we need to show Okay, so first of all, we know that uh, uh, we know that the the role is preserved on the the transformation, right? So what that means is that uh, if you if you take any u within a, okay, uh, j bar of phi t of u. So basically, my time average starting from a solution that's already evolved for time t, right, is actually equal to the time average if you start from u itself. Why? Because they are practically the same trajectory except for a time of t, right? So if you if you look at uh, a trajectory starting from u versus a trajectory starting from phi t of u, what's the difference? The trajectory starts with u evolved from time zero, but the trajectory starting from phi t of u started at time t, but starting from the time t, they are exactly the same trajectory, right? So if you look at the definition of j bar, you are averaging over infinite time, so any non-overlapping finite time of t actually doesn't matter when you're averaging over infinite length of time, right? So that means uh, um, the j bar function is preserved under the transformation bt. All right? Okay, so now if j bar is transformed uh, is uh, preserved on the transformation phi t and also the row so so this expectation is under the uh, is an is basically a, a integral under the original probability measure row okay that is also preserved under this uh, transformation phi t then the whole thing would be preserved under that transformation so it's basically a change of variable in the integration process. So, so this, um, are you familiar with uh, the definition of an expectation represented uh, uh, using a little bit, a little bit integral, right? It's, uh, it's basically an integral of the function times uh, times d rho, where rho is uh, this probability measure, right? So, so essentially. If this is true, then basically you just uh, need to perform a transformation of variables, right? So, so basically, uh, I can, I can just uh, say it here. So, expectation of j bar u times i a of u is actually by definition the integral of j bar u i a of u uh, d rho of u, right? So. Um, because of uh, this this equivalence uh, under transformation, I can write it as a j bar of phi t of u, right? So i a of uh, phi t of u, which is uh, okay. So so i a of phi t of u is uh, basically is either equal to zero or one, depending on if phi t of u is within a or not right so it is actually the same as if uh, u is within the reverse transformation um, so actually to, to make it uh, slightly easier I think I can basically put a negative sign here right so so basically uh, instead of uh, thinking about uh, thinking about the trajectory after time t, I'm thinking about the trajectory that started uh, at time minus t that comes to u, comes to the solution initial condition u after a time t, right? So, so basically, this uh, phi of minus t of u would be saying that I evolved the differential equation or the map backwards for time t. So if uh, uh, that's also 
true, right? Basically, the two trajectories would be overlapping for infinite time, but non overlapping only for a time t, right? So this is still true. So if I if I uh, substitute minus t here, uh, d, 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 d rho of phi minus t u. So this is just a, a change of variable, right? The two integral are exactly the same, except for instead of uh, denoting the in, the independent variable inside the integration as u, I'm just uh, using I'm just substituting u with a phi of minus t of u, right? So the integral, if I if I perform an integral, no matter if I call the independent variable x or y, right, uh, the integral come up to the be the same, right? So the change of variable is correct, okay? But now, uh, because of uh, this equality, I can write the integral as j bar of just uh, u, right? And the indicator function is basically saying that uh, if um, it can be just uh, written as a uh, phi of t of a u. This is because if the solution at minus t is within a, then the solution u would be within the set a evolved for a time t, right? So basically, these uh, two indicator functions would be the same. Okay, and also we know that uh, uh, the the probability rho is preserved under the transformation phi. So the last one is just equal to d rho of u, right? So what that means is that. Uh, uh, this whole thing, of course, by the definition, uh, is just equal to the expectation over rho of j bar of u times i phi t of u. Uh, phi t, oh, sorry, phi t of a u, right? So that uh, basically shows that uh, uh, the numerator is preserved on the like uh, under a transformation of a, and of course the uh, denomin uh, the denominator does not depend on the set a at all. Therefore, uh, the row prime is also preserved, right, under the map. All right. Okay. So so what this shows is that essentially a. Uh, if the definition one is not satisfied, then definition two also cannot be satisfied. Right? So, so if j bar is actually dependent of u, then uh, the the row cannot be unique. Basically, I have derived another u. Only when j bar is actually independent of u, right? If j bar is a constant or almost everywhere a constant, then you're going to see that the row prime of a, if you just get rid of j bar and the j bar in both denominator and numerator, right? For example, you can think of j bar is equal to one. Then the denominator would be expectation of one, which is one. And the numerator would be just the expectation of i a, which is just the, the probability of a, right? So then rho prime would actually be equal to rho for the same set a. That that basically takes the uh, connection between these two uh, definitions of egodicity. Okay. A any questions? When we say it's independent, it means that it doesn't uh, happen equal. Uh, if it's dependent of you, then it does not obey egodicity, right? So, is it really nature, or is nature what we have? In the nature, we can have all kinds of uh, dynamical systems. Some are egotic, some are not egotic, right? This this theorem basically s tells you that uh, uh, if a system satisfies egodicity in the second sense, it would also satisfy the egodicity in the first sense. All right. Egoic system or 
it also depends, right? You can you can uh, easily construct uh, even for the same governing equation. If you look at navier stokes equation for different geometries, you can have different uh, situations, right? So there are a lot of uh, situations actually. Uh, yeah, one of one of my uh, favorite examples is uh, I I studied uh, supersonic flows over a pair of airfoils, right? That's kind of a, a, analogous to a, uh, for example, a supersonic uh, inlet for an aircraft engine. So it turns out uh, the inlet can have two different solutions depending on what initial condition you give it. So one. One is a normal operating condition. The second is called the on-start. So what the on-start means is that uh, basically the flow, instead of uh, going supersonically into the inlet, uh, then decelerates smoothly into subsonic conditions, which then feeds into the jet engine. It actually decelerates uh, into subsonic conditions ahead of the engine inlet, right, creating a shock wave. And the which condition, I mean, that, that the second uh, case would be a non-operating condition because the engine would not be able to generate uh, substantial thrust. Instead, it actually generates substantial uh, drag because of the shock wave. So which situation you end up with actually doesn't just depending on the governing equation and the geometry. It also depends on the initial condition, right? So, so it's almost... Uh, it, it's a it's a situation we call hysteresis, um, usually in science and engineering, and uh, that basically translates into a non-egotic uh, situation. The solution you get actually depends on what initial condition you fit it. Okay, so so we don't know. I mean, depending on the uh, depending on the system, and even for the system, it may depend on the parameter, right? Okay. Now, uh, this this theorem also tells us a little bit of an intuition on what this unique role is, and uh, basically, it takes the connection between the long time average and uh, uh, the the probability measure that is preserved under the map. It actually tells you that uh, what rho is, is actually the percentage of time we are spending, right? A typical trajectory is spending on the set A. So why is it the case? Just to think about uh, uh, the rho, the measure operated... Uh, uh, Okay, so, so let's, let's just uh, construct a special J. So let J is equal to an indicator function IA. Okay. Right. Now, what is J bar of U? Well, so J of... Uh, the 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 inside of the integral, right? Uh, the j is either zero or one, depending on if the solution at that time t is within the set or not within the set, right? But after you take the long time integral, the result is not going to be the zero or one, but a number between zero and one, right? Because I'm actually averaging over a trajectory between 0 and t, part of the trajectory is within the set A, part of the trajectory is not within the set A, right? So the, if, you, if you not look at the limit, if you just look at the time average, the time average would be the percentage of time the trajectory is within the set A, right? Okay, then you take the time limit, it goes to infinity. It is essentially saying that on the infinitely long trajectory, starting from u, what is the percentage of time this infinitely long trajectory spent inside the set A? That's the meaning of j bar u, if j bar is a 
uh, indicator function. All right. Now, if you think about uh, uh, the equivalence of uh, j bar and the rho, right? So this is basically saying that uh, if you if you think about uh, the same definition, right, of rho prime, and uh, uh, if my j is that indicator function, so it it, it essentially tells you that uh, this rho has to coincide right rho of a has to equal to the let me say i a bar right of u so if u is actually independent uh, so if this i a bar is independent of u all right so that's a uh, that's basically um, right. So this is basically uh, you. You can you can show this by saying that uh, rho a uh, is equal to rho a is equal to the expectation of i a, which is also has to be the expectation of i a bar, right? And the expectation of i a bar because i a bar is a constant function almost everywhere, so it doesn't matter if I take uh, the expectation or not. So that's going to be equal to i a of u, right? So what we are saying is that uh, uh, the the probability measure that is preserved under the map is essentially equal to the percentage of time a typical trajectory is spending within the set, right? That is the intuitive uh, um, definition of this, uh, um, this probability measure. So with that, let's actually uh, come to how do we compute that egotic probability measure, right? So we can actually compute the egotic probability measure by actually simulating one or more trajectories and look at the, what is the percentage of time we are spending within the set. Okay. So let's uh, start with uh, a pretty, let's actually start uh, with a, uh, with this case, right? So this is the Van der Poel oscillator defined uh, uh, with uh, uh, in two-dimensional phase space, right? It is defined as a one uh, uh, a single ODE but second order. So we can write it as uh, two ODEs, uh, both first order. And uh, if we simulate that ODE, the trajectory comes over to something like this, right? So if you start uh, uh, near the origin, the spirals would come bigger and bigger. But if you start uh, far from the origin, you would get an in spiral. So at the end of the day, uh, the trajectories would be concentrated uh, in a narrow region. So let's see uh, how that works. So instead of uh, instead of uh, simulating for a short time, we can simulate for a much longer time. So we simulate for a hundred time units uh, with the same time steps. So after we perform the OD integration, right? So we don't just plot the entire trajectory, but we plot the trajectory starting after time, let's say, uh, 5, right? So this is, uh, because the time step size is uh, 0.01, right? This is basically plotting all the trajectories starting at t equal to 5. Um, Okay, so we see that uh, except for a few trajectories, all the trajectories are kind of on this uh, big uh, cycle, right? And if we probably want to start uh, even a little bit longer, so let's actually start after time 10. Uh, there's still one trajectory that started uh, very close to the origin that's still uh, not coming to the limit cycle yet. If you now uh, start from time 15, you're gonna see like almost all the trajectory are cycling on that uh, uh, almost like, uh, uh, yeah, like one limit cycle, right? 
streaming site, right? Mm -hmm. But when the thing is within the when the power oscillator is not a chaotic one, unless you force it with a okay. uh, periodic uh, uh, forcing. Oh, so the parameter, the input parameter you chose, makes it like. Uh, yeah, it is a lim This is uh, actually going to be a limit cycle for uh, for any positive a and the positive mu, right? The way to make it uh, chaotic, you have to actually add a sinusoidal forcing on to the second equation, right? That would be the typical chaotic uh, Van der Waals oscillator you, you might see elsewhere. All right. Yeah, if, if you don't add anything on the right-hand side, it is going to be a periodic linear cycle. Okay. So what we want to know is the what we call the stationary measure, right, or the unique uh, uh, probability measure that is preserved under this uh, uh, periodic cycle. So how do we compute that? The best way to compute that, well, for the Venterbo oscillator, for low dimensional systems like this, there are actually uh, other ways to compute it. But when you have a very high dimensional system, as we are going to look uh, later in the semester, the best way to uh, compute a probability measure in high dimensional space or, or do compute anything or for example the integration or, or, or anything uh, in a high dimensional space is actually through Monte Carlo method okay so what does Monte Carlo method do Monte Carlo method basically um, get a bunch of samples random or not that uh, conforms to the probability measure, right, and uh, uh, does something to it. The reason we prefer Monte Carlo method is that the convergence rate of Monte Carlo method is always proportional to the square root of the number of samples you have, right? I mean, in most cases, the number of samples is representative of the computational cost, right? So, so essentially, the convergence rate would be a 1 over square root or, or the error you get is proportional to 1 over square root of the computational effort you spend. So let me just say a little bit uh, over here. Monte Carlo method. So the error is proportional to O 1 over square root of uh, the cost. Okay, but for other methods, for other methods where you have to discretize the phase space, right? So, for example, if you discretize the phase space into uh, n sections, into n grid points in each dimension of the phase space, so let's say. Uh, into n grids, right? Uh, for each each of the d dimensions of the phase space. Okay, in in our Van der Waals oscillator, d is equal to two, right? Then the cost cost would be proportional to n to the d, right? while the error would be proportional to uh, 1 over n to the order of accuracy. So let's call it p. So uh, no matter what kind of numerical methods we use, right, uh, we are going to have a finite p. Well, I mean, so in a lot of cases, p is equal to 1 or 2 or 3, right, if you use more and more advanced numerical methods. So at the end of the day, my error is going to be proportional to 1 over cost to the power of what? p over d, right? So which method is preferable usually depends on the dimension d. So for two-dimensional uh, Van der Poel oscillator, usually it, it pays to discretize the phase space, 
right? Because uh, if I can use a even p equal to anything more than p equal to one, right? Uh, I can beat the Monte Carlo method. The speed here is the dimension or the the dimension of the phase space, which is the degree of freedom of the uh, differential equation or map, right? Yeah, so, so for example, right, uh, if you want to, uh, one of the way to compute the, one of the ways to compute, the, for example, the average magnitude of the uh, Van der Poel oscillator is by discretizing the phase space into n by n, uh, grids and by n grids and you can uh, calculate for example uh, the you can calculate uh, the probability that the trajectory spans on each of these uh, n by n grids right okay that allows you to approximate uh, that allows you to approximate uh, the egotic probability measure and uh, from that approximation, you can uh, compute a lot of uh, things, right? Like the, you can compute, uh, uh, for example, the average magnitude of the oscillation or the average of any objective function you are interested in. Okay, and uh, uh, right. So, so essentially, if you use a you, you can use any method that, that uh, computes the that, that follows the trajectory or that, that computes the probability to arbitrary precision right with a, a precision of 1 over n to the p right so that's uh, that's basically if you use a numerical method uh, for example that solves the uh, focal Planck equation so one of the uh, known methods of computing the probability density right uh, you, you can you can get an error of uh, depending on the order of the numerical method of an error like this. If you have a high D, right, you would always prefer the Monte Carlo method. Yeah, so, so if you have a partial differential equation, D is always going to be a huge number. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, so that's why uh, we're going to focus really on the Monte Carlo method for most of the, uh, the class. So let's, let's first uh, look at how do we use Monte Carlo method to compute the egotic probability measure over uh, the Van der Poel oscillator. Okay, so here we are still going to, um, let's actually give an example of computing the marginal probability density of X. Okay, so what we are actually going to be doing is uh, uh, we already have a solution U, right? And uh, X would be just the equal to U, uh, let's see, what is the shape of U? The shape of u, the first dimension is time, the second dimension is uh, uh, the second dimension is x or y, right? So x would be this. And in particular, we are going to take the trajectory after a while, after it reaches an equilibrium state, right? Because uh, because we are always going to be taking finite time trajectories. And uh, the, when we are looking at uh, the equilibrium measure, we want to really approximate as well as possible the concentration of the trajectory over infinite time. And the trajectory over infinite time, for most of the time, it is spent after the initial transient, right? After all the spiral has gone onto this uh, limit cycle. So that's why we are usually skipping an initial part of the trajectory where the solution has not uh, reached the, the limit cycle yet. Okay, And then uh, we are also taking a bunch of different trajectories and we just uh, combine them into a single array. Okay, So that's basically a collection of x over 
two dimensions. One dimension is a uh, different trajectory. It's the second dimension is different time. So we're basically uh, doing a combined uh, sampling both over time and over many different uh, initial conditions. And we'll just uh, plot the histogram of X. Okay, so let's make it uh, 101 bins. So that's going to give me really the probability density of my state X. So that's a, actually a pretty good representation of what the equilibrium measure is, right? Assuming you have egoticity. And uh, the uniqueness of the probability measure actually matters here because if you don't have uniqueness, right? So uh, the averaging over different trajectories actually would not work. So for example, over here, let's actually uh, do that actually several times. So let's see. So what we are going to be doing is that uh, we are going to be plotting the histogram, not just the over the entire set of trajectories, but over different subsets of trajectories, which start from different initial conditions. So here we are going to show all of them uh, for only on the first uh, on the first uh, uh, subplot. And on the second subplot, etc., we are going to show. Uh, did I include PyLab? Uh, it's not defined. Oh, I imported all, so I don't need the uh, PyLab. So we are just going to show the first trajectory. Yeah, and then we're going to show the second and the third trajectory, right? Oh, sorry. So this is uh, actually, this is still going to be zero, but uh, the different trajectories are going to be the third dimension. And we need a column to represent anything after t equal to 20. Okay, so basically, uh, let me capture this so that uh, I don't have uh, all the stuff showing up. Okay, so what we see is that, uh, of course, the number is going to be much larger in the first uh, plot uh, because the, we have a lot more trajectories, right? We have a hundred times uh, more trajectories than the individual ones. But uh, the overall shape of the histogram looks identical. Right, that means no matter what initial condition you choose, uh, we actually get the pretty much the same probability uh, distribution. The primary difference is that uh, uh, the first one looks very smooth, right? While the other individual trajectories have uh, significant noises in the histogram. So if you look at the detail of the noises, they are going to be different for each trajectory. So that means that uh, uh, these are basically the Monte Carlo error we are encountering, right? And by averaging over a lot more trajectories, we are removing this Monte Carlo error and uh, get a much smoother distribution. If you use the Monte Carlo, we so so basically this is a Monte Carlo uh, result of what is the percentage of time the trajectory spends in the set of x greater than minus uh, 2 and x less than did 101 less than 0.196 right so so the first being would be right so so what we are doing is uh, we are basically plotting a bunch of bings, right? So if this is x, then the first bing is minus 2 and minus 0.196, right? Because I have 100 bings and x goes from minus 2 to 2, right? So uh, this is the set A that is x uh, 
so it is u is i mean the u is x and y right such that x is greater than 2 and uh, uh, less than 0 0.169 so this would be a set right and what we are really computing is the is the probability measure over that set in particular if you if you can divide this whole number by the uh, if you can divide the number which is around uh, 50,000 by the total number so let me actually print it uh, here x dot size right if you if you divide this uh, yeah if you divide 50,000 by this number right the total uh, the total number of points within the histogram you get uh, the probability measure of of this uh, this set similarly the height of the other beams divided by this number here would be a monte carlo approximation of the uh, probability measure of these different sets yes yeah this so one Uh, yes, the solution does slow down over here and over here, right? That that is, that is why you see this uh, a rounded shape over here, right? So so the y-axis is x dot, oh. right? So when x dot is equal to zero, that means the speed of the axis are zero, right? And in particular, it switches from negative speed to, to positive speed over here. That is why you have this uh, a concentration at the two ends. Yeah. So it, actually, if you if you split into more and more bins, the the tip is going to go higher and higher, right? The, the probability density function actually goes to infinity at both ends. Yeah, because of the rounded the trajectory. Yeah. Good question. But, so I don't understand how this is. So if you obtain the split mean and the root mode. Mm -hmm. So okay, so I did obtain the solution over an ODE solver, right? Yeah. So so basically, the error in the ODE solution uh, has a we have a, some numerical error in the ODE solution, but that's not going to be the primary source of the error in most uh, of uh, the Monte Carlo simulations. In, in most of Monte Carlo simulations, the error comes from insufficient uh, samples. Right, so so for example, if I if I run the trajectory for much less time, mm, if I run it uh, for only uh, let's see thirty time units, okay, I would get pr uh, pretty much the same trajectory. But if I look at the probability density function right uh, uh, we basically get a lot of uh, a lot more error right that's because um, that's because uh, if you look at the definition or, or of this function right uh, this the definition of the function is a limit of t goes to infinity but in practice we are only taking a finite time right that finite time sample um, introduces the Monte Carlo error and you can overcome that Monte Carlo error in the finite time by actually using a lot of uh, initial conditions right and that's what we have done but uh, uh, still the, the amount of uh, Monte Carlo error you get is going to be proportional to 1 over the square root of the number of samples times the length of the uh, time integration. So what's the non-Monte Carlo way of finding the probability? Uh, okay, so what is the non-Monte Carlo way of finding out the probability measure? So one of the typical methods you can use for low dimensional system is to actually derive a set of uh, partial differential equations that actually governs the 
the the change of the density. So uh, that governs. Let me let me write write it over here. So the non Monte Carlo method. Monte Carlo method. Is uh, if you if you have a let's say a row zero, okay, that actually uh, you can you can define it by uh, defining like over the two dimensional space. What is the probability of this set, this set, this set, etc. Right, and you can randomize the initial row zero, and you can derive a set of uh, uh, row zero, you can you can write it actually you you can represent it as a probability density function row zero of x and y right, and you can uh, you can define a transformation from row zero to row t also as a function of x and y. So so that's called uh, the the uh, Wrong. It's called uh, the a focal Planck equation. Essentially, it's a a pure advection. It's a so, so it's a it's a conservative uh, advection equation in the sense that uh, you have the prob uh, partial row. Partial t plus um, the partial partial x of rho times the uh, the evolution yeah the evolution of this equation okay in the x direction so it's essentially let me call it fx of x and y plus partial partial y of rho times fy of x and y equal to zero. So so this f is uh, is basically what's defining the equation, right? The, what's defining the equation for an ODE that's defined as a dx dt is equal to fx of x and t. And uh, uh, dy dt is equal to fy of x and t uh, of x and y. So, so what this does is that uh, um, you you are essentially drawing like a flow diagram in these two dimensions. So, for the uh, for the van der Waals oscillator, the flow diagram is uh, something similar to. To this, right? You are you you have a direction of flow that uh, goes towards this, goes towards uh, the oscillator, towards the limit cycle, both from inside and outside, and that's you can think of this as a velocity in in x and y, right? And uh, uh, you can solve a evolution equation for the density that governed by the flow of that velocity. So, so you, you can imagine, like if you are familiar with uh, uh, partial differential equations that governs conservation laws, you can imagine like all this velocity just uh, uh, pushes all the density towards almost a singular limit cycle. Okay, so so that is going to give you a density function. Uh, rho t of an x and y, and as t goes to infinity, that density function is going to converge also to the uh, equilibrium density. So that's a typical way of computing the probability density, not by following trajectories, but by actually solving the PDE. Right in here, you are not going to be suffering from the uh, Monte Carlo error, right? So. Because as time goes to infinity, uh, the convergence to that uh, probability density function is actually exponential. So you 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 are no longer uh, having the sampling error, but you do have discretization error, right? In, in that uh, the the density is now represented as a discrete function, and uh, uh, for 
for all the methods I have seen, the accuracy p ends up to be 1. The reason is that uh, the probability density function in most cases are going to be singular. Right? So, so dynamical systems uh, uh, separates into what's known as conservative dynamical systems and uh, uh, dissipative dynamical systems. And uh, uh, most of the systems we're going to be studying is dissipative systems for which the equilibrium measure is going to be singular, right? It's not going to have a nice probability density function over the whole space in the sense that uh, the probability density function defined over an n-dimensional function is zero almost everywhere and infinite at a small subset of the space, just like in in, in our case, right? Uh, the You can imagine the density is zero inside of the circle, it's zero outside of the circle, but uh, it spikes to infinity, like on the circle, right? So when you look at the marginal density, it's a nice smooth function, but if you look at the joint density function over the two-dimensional space, it's not going to be a nice function. As a result of that, uh, uh, any high-order method uh, that solves this equation ends up to only getting a first-order accuracy. Okay. So, so basically for two dimensions, uh, these two methods are actually going to give you the same rate of convergence, but if you're looking at high dimension, then uh, you would definitely prefer Monte Carlo method. Okay, good question though. Any other questions? If you have very what? Yeah, that's a very good question, and it's actually uh, not an easy question in, in the sense that if you have a very high dimension and very expensive system, what is the best method to reduce the system while still preserving the dynamics, right? And uh, uh, this is a really a question that is answered by uh, model order reduction or reduced order modeling. And uh, uh, the early research of reduced order modeling mostly looks at uh, non-chaotic systems and they try to preserve the dynamics of these. And only recently do people in reduced order modeling start to look at uh, how do we preserve the dynamics and uh, the, the behavior, the long-time behavior, right, or the st statistical behavior of chaotic systems. So it is actually a very active area of research right now. So, yeah, very good question. All right. Okay. So, so this is uh, basically how do we compute the egotic probability measure, and uh, not only can we compute uh, the probability measure like by plotting a histogram like that, but we can also integrate or take the expectation of any function over the egotic probability measure by using the same kind of a Monte Carlo method. Okay. So essentially, if we want to compute uh, uh, the expectation over rho of any function j, right, through uh, our, our egotic theory, we know that uh, this is actually equal to the limit of t goes to infinity. Actually, let's just get rid of the limit. We know it actually is approximately equal to for very long time t, right? 1 over t times integration from 0 to t of j of phi t u times dt. So integrating any function, any observable over the egotic probability measure is just the time averaging, right? Okay, so um, so that is a, again like a Monte Carlo 
way of uh, computing that uh, uh, the, the integral. So, so for example, if we just uh, want to compute uh, the average of x squared, right? So, so because x uh, is uh, symmetric, the average of x has to be zero. But if we want to compute uh, the uh, the egotic uh, measure over uh, integrated uh, over x squared. What we can just uh, do is uh, uh, let's see. So we can take our x square, right, and uh, uh, just to take the mean. integral of x square over the egotic measure. Right, so, so that's going to be our approximation for, for how big uh, the expectation of x square is going to be. All right, so it's as simple as just uh, taking the time average. Okay, so so that's basically uh, our initial discussion on egodicity, right? And our computation of uh, uh, of statistical properties of the system. So we're going to come back to that when we start looking at chaotic systems. And a lot of things that are looks trivial on the periodic system uh, starts to become a lot more interesting for chaotic systems. The remaining of this lecture will introduce the optimum exponents, which is related to another type of egodicity. So the the both concepts of egodicity we have introduced are what's known as uh, additive egodicity. Right. The reason it is called the additive egodicity is because of uh, this kind of uh, averaging. Right. When we are averaging either over the phase space. Right, I mean, so so usually this uh, egotic probability measure role is thought of as an ensemble. Okay, you have an infinite uh, many solutions or initial conditions that is an ensemble, and you are distributing the ensemble according to the uh, equilibrium probability measure. Right, in that sense, this ensemble is uh, is known as uh, in equilibrium. Okay, so that means as time evolves, the distribution of that ensemble is not going to evolve in time. So that's what we call like a, an ensemble in equilibrium. So taking expectation over that ensemble is basically just the adding up that function, that observable, right, evaluated on each uh, of each member of the ensemble and dividing by the number of uh, elements in the ensemble. So that's additive. What we are uh, also the averaging time is also an additive averaging, right? I remember, like uh, for a discrete system, we are replacing the integral with literally a summation, right? So, so that's additive. But uh, the Lyapunov exponents are defined uh, with the concept of a multiplicative egodicity. In order to think about that. We need to uh, first define what we yeah we, we need to uh, first of all define uh, what we mean by multiplicative uh, egodicity. So we, we first of all we want to uh, define a transformation, right? If we have a phi t that uh, maps from uh, the phase space to itself, right? U, uh, we are also defining leads to the the tangent dynamics we usually call just the d phi of t u okay so this this d phi t u is actually a, a d by d matrix. So let's say u is a uh, in a, a d dimensional phase space. All 
okay then this d phi t u is a d by d matrix okay so what defines this d by d matrix is that um, is that this matrix operated on a d dimensional vector v okay is going to give you the tangent solution so let me let me call it out it is actually equal to phi t of u plus epsilon v minus phi t of u divided by epsilon as uh, as epsilon goes to infinity right so or let me just uh, call it a limit of epsilon goes to uh, epsilon goes to zero so so what does the right hand side mean the right hand side means you take the initial condition u and you perturb it by epsilon v right so basically uh, I'm looking at the two trajectories one starting from u the other starting from a neighborhood of u and the difference the initial difference between these two solutions are epsilon times v I evolve both solutions for a time period of t and then look at what is the difference between these two trajectories after t times of evolution right that divided by the magnitude of the initial perturbation is uh, what the final perturbation is all right again uh, there is a linearity assumption in that uh, uh, in that epsilon goes to zero right as epsilon goes to zero what we uh, can show is that uh, uh, these solution actually satisfies the tangent equation so if a d dt of phi t of u satisfies the differential equation f of phi t u right so that's the differential equation that gov governs the dynamics then the time derivative of the tangent so let me just uh, call it uh, uh, d phi t u v so would be equal to partial f partial u so let me just call it a df so df is really the uh, Jacobing of f right multiplied with d phi t u of v okay so that means uh, this is really just uh, the solution to the tangent equation make sense so so we can uh, as we are going to do in the next lecture we are going to be using exactly the same kind of a technique to solve the tangent equation as we did uh, uh, during our study of the dynamics around the fixed point except uh, except uh, the the phi of t of u is no longer a fixed point so this is no longer independent of time right as in the fixed point situation this is now follows around a uh, periodic trajectory but uh, the tangent dynamics is defined using the same way like dv over dt equals dx times dt. Yes, in the tangent dynamics, uh, uh, in the original tangent dynamics, we are uh, we are basically defining that uh, we are defining v. Let's say uh, so in our, in our old notation, right? We are saying we are defining v t as 
Okay, so so let me let me uh, start with our U, right? Our our own our note uh, old notation, we have U T, right? Uh, being the V T of U zero, right? And our V T would be the D V T of U zero operated on V zero, right? So if you follow this old notation, then we have ddt of v is equal to df times v. In our in this notation, we are basically uh, removing, yeah, we, we are basically using the operator to denote a time integration. But even if you don't have uh, time to dynamics, it also satisfies the equation. Dv dt equal tangent Jacobian time. Yeah, dv dt equal to yeah df times v. Right. Yeah, that's right. So why do we need uh, tangent dynamics here? Add something extra. Uh, we are just uh, defining this linear operator here, right? This this uh, d by d matrix here. This, this uh, basically, yeah. Basically, we we are we are using this operator to explicitly denote that the solution of this linear equation is linear with respect to the initial condition of v. Right. So so v t is a linear uh, function of v0 right and that's because this equation is linear and uh, we are basically using this d by d matrix to represent um, what kind of linear function to represent that particular linear function so actually that uh, operator times v equals to v yes yes right uh, that uh, yes, right. Th this V is the initial condition for the tangent uh, dynamics. Yeah, uh, if you if you want to if you want to stick to the old notation, we can basically put uh, u zero and v zero on on all of the green and the red lines. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. So so that's basically. Uh, basically, u denotes the initial condition of u, and v denotes the initial condition of v here. All right. Okay. So, so this is the definition of this uh, uh, the tangent dynamics, uh, uh, which is a d by d matrix that depends on two things. It depends on t, and depends on u, right? In particular. Uh, d of phi zero of u is equal to what? Think about the definition. Identity, right? Why? I'm not evolving because uh, phi t, right, when t is equal to zero, is also just the identity right phi t of u plus epsilon v is just u plus epsilon v phi t of u is just equal to u right if you did do the division you just get v itself no matter what v is the operator operated on v is going to be equal to v so that operator has to be an identity right and uh, uh, so basically these are the properties uh, the second property we have is uh, if you multiply two operators so T1 of U, um, let me write it uh, a little bit uh, further away. So if you multiply this operator with another operator, that's D of T2 of not U, but uh, da, 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 da. I think I wrote, wrote it wrong. So d phi t2, but 
but not starting from you, but starting from fifty one of you. Do you see what that is? So basically, I, I operate the tangent dynamics over t time, starting from u, and then operate, uh, then use that as an initial condition, right, for the tangent equation, and use phi t one of u as the initial condition for, for the nonlinear solution, and evolve for another t two time. That has to equal to d phi of t one plus t two. Starting from solution U. Okay, so this property leads to the so-called the multiplicative multiplicative property of uh, of in the um, multipl multiplicative ergodicity theorem. Okay, so so basically these two properties are central uh, to what's going to be defining the Lyapunov exponents. Okay, the Lyapunov exponent is uh, uh, exponents are the limit of a t goes to infinity. Again, there is a one over t. But there is a logarithm, okay, the logarithm of the magnitude of this uh, tangent dynamics, d v t of u operated on some v. So. Um, so what does that mean? It means I start with a tangent equation. I start with a tangent equation with the solution v, right? I evolve it for t times, and look at what is the magnitude of that tangent solution at time t. I take the logarithm of the magnitude and divide it by t. Okay, that uh, that ratio has a finite limit. Okay, so so basically the the uh, multiplicative ergodic theorem basically says that uh, this kind of lambdas exist. So lambda uh, exists, and uh, can take up to d values, uh, right? So, so basically, the number of values it can take only depends on the dynamical system. It does not depend on u. It does not uh, depend on v. Okay, it depends on the combination of u and v. Uh, there could be different uh, lambdas. Okay, so that's basically the statement of the theorem. Now, what does it mean by practice? So let's actually first look at uh, what it means by practice uh, in practice for a trivial system that is uh, uh, the dynamics around a fixed point which we already looked at. And we'll see, like, uh, for periodic cycles, that's going to be a, a little bit different. So for a fixed point, for a fixed point, what is d phi t of u, right? Uh, for a fixed point, uh, let's say u, what is that? So 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 let's let's say if the fixed point is uh, uh, 
let's say uh, the dynamics around the fixed point is uh, yeah let's say dv dt v is the uh, is equal to a times v right so let's say this defines the tangent dynamics then this matrix is just uh, e to the a right the matrix that uh, give me an initial condition for the uh, tangent dynamics I give you the solution at time time t it's just equal to the matrix e to the a right oh e to the a t yeah thank you yes okay um, so then what is the logarithm of the magnitude of e to the a t times v Well, we can see that it depends on uh, which eigenvector V contains, right? If V contains an eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigen, uh, the, the most positive eigenvalue of A, which is the largest magnitude eigenvalue of E to the AT, then this grows, uh, let me just uh, not look at the, let, let me just uh, get rid of the logarithm for now so this would grow like e to the lambda 1 t right for almost any v the magnitude would grow exponentially with the largest uh, exponent and if you uh, take the logarithm of that you get lambda 1 t right plus a constant which is going to be uh, non-relevant anymore once you once you divide it by t as t goes to infinity okay so that means uh, 1 over t times logarithm of that thing is going to converge to lambda 1 so that is for almost all v but what if I just uh, by accident have a v that does not contain any component of the first uh, eigenvector right then the same limit would actually converge to lambda 2 the second most positive eigenvalue and uh, then by coincidence if V also doesn't contain any component in the first two uh, most positive eigenvectors then this limit would converge to lambda 2 I mean lambda 3 right so so essentially the Lyapunov exponents in the case of a fixed point just degenerates to the eigenvalues of the matrix. Okay, so, so we will explore this similarity in the next uh, lecture and uh, use practically the same algorithm we used uh, in the dynamics around the fixed points to compute the Lyapunov exponents uh, of the the power oscillator and see what they are so I'll see you um, yeah next Monday all right